I must say, even though I already gave this uh, talk in uh, Italy, in Italian, and David was present, but his Italian is not that great. So I was much more comfortable. Now I'm afraid he's going to say, but we'll see. First of all, this film is one of the films that I love the most. And unfortunately, this evening, I will not speak of the aesthetic of the film, of the beauty of the film, which must be mentioned because it's really intrinsic. I'm going to look at it more uh, from an anthropological, sociological point of view. And, but always keep in mind the beauty because if we go to the cinema, if we read a book, the anthropological, sociological aspects are very, very important. But because it's a film, because it's a novel, because it's a short story, we have to go beyond that. This evening, I'm unfortunately only going to talk about the sociological aspects of film, media, and the representation of organized crime. And we're going to look at the myths, the symbols, and the rituals. How do all these groups continue to have power after all these years? Well, the first thing we have to say is that the word mafia today includes all the groups, all the organizations who belong, who work with a given code. So mafia is not only Italian mafia. Mafia is also used for the triads, for the yakuza, for all the organized crime groups that work with a code. And these groups are, the most important ones are obviously Mafia, Ndrangheta, and Camorra, which are the three Italian most important, the, most, the three most important Italian organized crime groups. There's a two more that are not as important. And obviously, then we have the Triads, the Yakuza, and the Vori Zakona. Now, paradoxically, many of you may not know that the most powerful and the richest organized crime group today in the world is the Indrangata. Almost impossible to pronounce, Indrangata. It is a word that comes from the Calabrian because Indrangata is the organized crime group that has a base in Calabria, Mafia in Sicily, and Camorra in Campania, in the Naples region. Mafia in the United States of America is known as Cosa Nostra, and the Cosa Nostra of the United States has its base in the Mafia, which is in Sicily. Now, when we speak of mafia, automatically the first thing that comes to mind are mafia and Drangheta and Camorra and Italy. Well, I'm not going to dwell into the origins of the word mafia, but I can say that the first time that the word appears in Italian, the first ever time that I have found is in a play called The Mafiosi of the Vicaria. What does this mean? Well, it's interesting because in this play, which has mafiosi in the title, what we have is it is in a prison where there is a group of prisoners who have a code, who have omerta. Omerta is the obligation of not speaking, of not saying anything. And we also have the use for this first time of another word which is fundamental for the mafia, which is pizzo. Pizzo in Italian means lace, but in the dialect of the organized crime groups, pizzo means what people need to pay in order to get protection from the mafia groups. So in this play, for the first time ever, we have the word used. What is interesting is that only a year later is the word used again by the prefect of the city of Palermo. There are many arrests, and the prefect writes, there is this organization called the Mafia, and these people we have just arrested belong to the Mafia. 
So this was 1863. In 1864, the prefect of Palermo uses it in his report. And only the following year, for the first time in an Italian dictionary, there is the word mafia. Why is this interesting? Well, because all these characteristics of these organized crime groups, huh? mafia, andrangata, and camorra, these characteristics are also find in, found in the Yakuza, in the triads, in the Russian mafia. And the triads and the Yakuza actually have been around for many, many years before the attestation of the word mafia. So although mafia is automatically, also thanks to the use of the word, but automatically the idea of organized crime is linked to the Italian peninsula and to, the, and to Sicily, technically it seems that it is really something that developed in many parts of the world and paradoxically it developed in other parts of the world before it actually became um, known in Italy. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that very likely the organized crime groups in Italy at that time did not have all these characteristics. What is also very interesting is, did then these groups imitate what is written in the play and thus came afterwards, or do we only not have a document that attests that the mafia groups existed beforehand? So what we have is the absurd situation in which, as I was saying, the groups seemed to have copied art. So it's art that is not copying life as many people think art works. In this case, it almost would look like the organized crime groups actually got things from this play and then enacted them. It also happens in other things. Think, for example, of the film Scarface by De Palma. If you remember, the people in the organized crime groups in Scarface, De Palma had them shooting sideways. Before the film, they did not shoot like this. They all shot like this. And even in the film we just saw, at a certain point, uh, you saw the character played by Vigo that goes. That was for the first time in the film. And now it is used by members of various organized crime groups. Think of The Sopranos. Have you seen The Sopranos? The, so The Sopranos um, series was based once again on a real family of mafiosi from New Jersey. They were a minor family. They were not considered as being real mafia by the mafiosi in New York. But right now, they're all in jail, all of them. You know why? Because when they saw two things. First of all, they saw the, on television the Sopranos and imitated them. So then they did things they saw on television. But more importantly, the FBI had them under surveillance. And they would say, I didn't shoot him twice. I shot him three times. What are they doing on TV? Right? So there's this really, really weird aspect of this almost symbiosis between what is happening on a screen or on TV and who they are. And this is real life. I collaborate with one of the major experts on organized crime in the world, and his name is Antonio Nicaso, who also collaborates with a very important Italian magistrate called Nicola, sorry, Nicola Grattieri. One day, we, he teaches with me at the university, and a police officer, a captain, comes, and he's smiling. And he says, Antonio, I need to speak to you. And we were in my office. His office is next to mine. And I was about to go, and Antonio said, no, no, Donato can, can stay, no problem. 
So this police officer is smiling, officer is smiling and he says, I have to have you listen to something. So he takes out his computer and he presses a button and we hear a recording of two mafiosi speaking to each other. And better, two people from Landrangata speaking to each other. And the, and the captain, the police officer says, they want to kill you, but he's smiling. I'm kind of upset. I mean, we have here a threat of someone from the org an organized crime group who wants to kill my friend and you're smiling. I was very confused. And you're a police officer. I, I thought maybe he's like, you know, the character. So he presses this button and we hear in, in Calabrian, I'm gonna kill that Nico Antonio Nicaso. And the other guy on the other phone, why? Why do you want to kill him? You know, what did he do? He's an ass, I know, but why do you want to kill him? He did not mention me, not even once in his book. <laughs> this is a true story. So really, just to tell you how media uh, plays such an important role, because once again, if we speak of how the organization can continue to exist and operate, you have to be known. You have to be known and you, because if you are not known, it won't work. See, the idea is that I do not have to tell you that I am from the tr part of triads or yakuza. Everyone should know. Because when I come to you and say, how are you today? And how's your son? You're going to understand that I am threatening you, but I'm not saying anything. There's no, there's no way that I'm going to say it directly. So the idea of being part of this is essential. And very often, the media, cinema, and other types of representation have influenced the way the organized crime people see themselves, but also as, as the public sees them. Because how they were perceived has changed very much over the years. Organized crime groups, as we said, have been around for many, many years. But maybe the fundamentals of organized crime, at least from Italy, can be really traced down to an opera, actually to a short story. A short story by a very important Italian writer called Verga. Verga wrote this short story, in Malavoglia, sorry, so this novel, in Malavoglia, but he is all, and he's, which he is famous for, but well, he also wrote Cavalleria Rusticana, which yeah. then later became an opera. Why is it so important? Because many of those traits that we spoke of, but especially honor, is fundamental, is a fundamental part of the plot of La Cavalleria Rusticana. The story is about a man who has to leave the town in Sicily, goes back and his, and his fiancée married someone else, and then he starts a relationship with her, and ultimately he is killed because he needs to be punished for dishonoring the other man. So honor plays a very, very important role in the opera and in La Cavalleria Rusticana. So did this opera really invent the mafia? Well, it did in the sense that it was one of the first expressions in which those values, and I use this term very loosely, that inform the behavior of people in the mafia are found in La Cavalleria Rusticana. The rituality, the fact that, and we'll see a clip, that it's all very ritualized. And the fact that it was opera is even more important. Why? Because opera, unlike today, many, a hundred years ago, was like cinema in the sense that opera was, yes, for the upper class and for the aristocracy, but also the poorer classes all went to the opera and were up in the stalls. So it was really something that was also popular. People didn't know how to read, but they were able to then understand these things and absorb them. <laughs> Primo do 
In the opera, other than honor, vendetta. These are the two main themes of the opera. This is why it is so obvious that this opera plays an important part in the development, in a certain sense, of the way mafiosi behave. And it's not by chance that what we're looking at now is Francis Ford Coppola's The Godfather Three. He actually comments on it on, himse on it himself, and he says, it is a style of the Godfather movies that a ritual is going on, and interwoven with the ritual are the re resolutions, which are usually murders. And so for The Godfather 3, I thought it was very appropriate that the opera Cavalleria Rusticana would be that ritual. So. What we have here is Coppola, who decides to use this opera because he understands that it does represent those things that are at the basis of the code of organized crime groups. The other thing is always, and here, that official justice should never be sought. Again, Francis Ford Coppola in The Godfather 1 will use that. Where at the beginning of the film, what we have is someone who's going to ask for justice. I believe in America. America has made my fortune. And I raised my daughter in the American fashion. I gave her freedom, but I taught her never to dishonor her family. She found a boyfriend, not an Italian. She went to the movies with him. She stayed out late. I didn't protest. Two months ago, he took her for a drive with another boyfriend. They made her drink whiskey. And then they tried to take advantage of her. She resisted. She kept her honor. So they beat her like an animal. When I went to the hospital, her nose was broken. Her jaw was shattered, held together by wire. She couldn't even weep because of the pain. But I wept. Why did I weep? She was the light of my life. Beautiful girl. Now she will never be beautiful again. <coughs> Sorry. I... I went to the police like a good American. These two boys were brought to trial. The judge sentenced them to three years in prison and suspended the sentence. Suspended the sentence? They went free that very day. I stood in the courtroom like a fool. And those two bastards, they smiled at me. Then I said to my wife, for justice, we must go to Don Corleone. Why didn't you go to the police? Why didn't you come to me first? What do you want of me? Tell me anything. What do what I beg you to do? What is that? So this scene is very disturbing for me because what is happening is if on the one hand Coppola is showing us 
the showing us that for organized crime groups, you mustn't go to the police, but you have to go to organized crime and to the padrino, to the godfather, to solve the problem. He's putting it in a light in which we all are, we are almost in accordance, in agreement with the father who has received this injustice. Because he puts it in a context in which this man's daughter was almost raped and the two boys who did it went free. How dare the justice system send them free? So I go to the Godfather. And what happens? The audience mostly agrees with the fact that it is right to ask for the Godfather to intervene. So not only, if you look at the Godfather, he has a cat. He's humanized in many ways. The real situation is very different. The situation is that they go to the Godfather to solve things not that you know, that may have some sympathy. They go because someone opened the shop next to theirs and they don't like it. Or they go because a son or a daughter spoke badly about them. Look at this surveillance video. This is John Gotti. Uh, when, when they told your son, your, your father or your uncles or your grandfather is a gangster, I mean, you know, what a man he is. Your mother dreams of going to bed with him every night. You punk, you weasel. I won't go back and tell him. They used to call me names in school. I went back and told your mother. We dusted them off. Broke their heads. He, now, you, let he me was, finish. He let, me finish. Let, me, me. let me finish. Let me finish. Now you go and you see the mother or the teacher. Am I correct? I called the mother. You called the mother. Your mother. The mother started off polite, you said, and then she got indignant and nasty. Mm -hmm. You should have went there and told the mother, listen, do you want me to tell my, my father? Do you want him to handle it his way? She would have shit herself. Do you want to wake up in the morning and don't see your son no more? Is that what you desire? Do you want us to cut his tongue out of his mouth? You don't have to tell him. You make your husband somebody tell him. He knew about you know, it. The didn't do anything. Been, the woman would have been. The woman would have been like this, and the kid would have been like that. You see, instead you went and rat. So as you see, what happened here? God is in prison. That's his daughter, and her son was bullied by another boy at school. So she went to the principal and she phoned the mother to complain. And what is God is saying? We don't go to the authorities, which in this case is the principal. All you should have said is, I'm going to tell my father. And you don't want your boy to come back home tonight? You, could, you should have told him, we're going to pull his tongue out. He's talking about a little boy. This is the reality. Whereas in the film, it's almost... There's some sympathy there. The reality is very different. This individual is saying to tell the mother, we're going to kill your son, and that we're going to pull, take his tongue out. For what? For bullying his grandson. So this is the reality that the film, and we'll see that very often in many films, and this is why I love Eastern Promises, but also uh, a history of violence by David, because really there is no such compromise. Bad is bad, and there are no compromise, compromising. There's bad and there's good. And the idea is that we're presenting with these films, and we'll see also films with triads and with the Yakuza, almost as if there's a good organized crime and a bad organized crime. At the end of Eastern Promises, when Vigo's character says, we don't kill babies, he's just saying something that is mythological. That is not true. But that the people in organized crime believe. It's not that they don't believe it. It's not that they don't think that they have a good heart or they don't have a purpose. They do believe that, but it's not true. It is just a myth, a myth which is at the basis of their existence. And this is why they can continue having the power they have today. But it is not only the name of the organizations that are important that need to be recognized. It is also the names of the individuals themselves, especially if you think of Lucky Luciano, Scarface. All these nicknames are important. It's almost as once you become initiated in a group, you have to be rebaptized. 
And by being rebaptized, you have to have a name that, again, is very recognizable. And there, the, the members of the organized crime groups are very much aware of this. For example, in an interview, you have um, Frank Costello, who is really, really ahead of, the, of his times. Because we're talking, this is happening in 1949. This is what he says. He even was philosophical about the publicity which had become his cross. This is the mafioso speaking. I'm like Coca-Cola. There are lots of drinks as good as Coca-Cola. Pepsi-Cola is a good drink, but Pepsi-Cola never got the advertising Coca-Cola got. I'm not Pepsi-Cola. I'm Coca-Cola because I got so much advertising. But why do you need to be Coca-Cola? To have that power, to have that added to be perceived in such a way where you really don't need to say, you don't know who I am. You no, know, that's why. You need to be known and you have to make, quote unquote, a name for yourself. But all this is useless if behind it, the organizations don't have a myth, something that justifies their existence. And George Orwell said it better, I think, than anyone else. He says, myths that are believed tend to become real. Myths that are believed in tend to become real. And this is historically very, very true. It's not by chance that in the Greeks' mythologies were not considered something that was not true. They were considered real stories. They were considered things that dealt with reality. Perhaps the philosopher who understood this more than anyone else is a very important Napoleon, Napolitan philosopher called Giambattista Vico of the 18th century, who defined myth as, in Latin, vera narratio, true narration. The gods, the mythology for the Greeks, were not fiction. The Greeks, ancient Greeks, did not need faith for to, to understand or believe in the, in, 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 in the myth. The myth is. There was no projection. There was no nece nothing necessary for them to do. It was just as it was. And now, this becomes important because the organizations this way, with a myth, not only determine the raison d'etre, of its existence, of their existence, but also this way create the necessary premise to prove the benevolent good nature of the organization whose only purpose in mythology is to defend the weak, the people, from the powerful. And this idea that organized crime groups are anti-government, that are anti status quo is not true. There is no possibility whatsoever in any part of the world with the triads, with the Russian mob, with the Yakuza, if there is no collusion with the state, there cannot be mafia. <laughs> it just can't work. There has to be collusion. And this collusion has been around for a long time. Think. One of the things that is fascinating is that at the beginning of the Second World War, or when the Soviet Union got involved in the Second World War, Stalin actually offered many members of the organized crime group to join the military to, f to fight against the Germans. Now, the major... One of the major roles for the Russian mob is that you cannot be in the military and you cannot work for the government. If you remember the scene in the film, Vigo's character's father worked for the government. That's why he is absolutely someone that you must despise. But Stalin asked members of, of the organized crime groups to fight promising them to be that they would be free at the end of the war. They are not all of them accept, but at the end of the war, Stalin does not keep his word, 
and he has them all returned to Siberia in the jail, in the various jails, where most of them are killed. This episode is called the War of the Bitches. And I'm translating bitches from the Russian, which has also the meaning of traitor, of someone who is backstabbing you. This was possible because the people, the guards in the various prisons, pretended not to see. And even during the Chinese Revolution, both the Nationalist Army and Mao Zedong tried to get the organized crime groups to fight for them. In China, at the end, the triads actually supported the Nationalists against Mao Zedong. And obviously, after the victory of Mao Zedong, they were all incarcerated. But what is important is that Mao Zedong writes that they are cunning, they, are, they, they know how to use weapons, etc., so they would be good for the revolution. There's no ideological uh, position against these, these organized crime groups because they're seen as a means, because of their power, because of their being able to fight and have been fighting for so long, the idea was to get them in. We saw what, I, I told you what happened with Stalin. Instead, with Mao Zedong, they actually join the nationalist side. So, myth. They have to create these myths. As I said, a myth is also the sum of structure in history, traditional narration. So, it is because myth is necessarily traditional, as I said, that the ancient Greeks held it to be true. And it's not by chance that at the end of the 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th, with the great crisis of both rationalism and the idea of God's death with Nietzsche, many philosophers and writers actually tended towards the idea of the mythical to overcome the impasse, this impossibility of having certainties. So myth for human beings, together with symbols, have a sort of substructure which really attracts us to make things more believable, to make things more real and more true, paradoxically. Going back to the various organized crime groups, we have foundational myths. But before that, let's look at a few non-organized crime groups. Livio's book uh, was very important because in his Ab Urbe Condita, he tells the story of the foundation of Rome, the myth, not the real story, of Romulus and Remus, R Romulus and Remus that you know were adopted by a she-wolf who dragged. Now, that was a myth, just like the myth that Virgil wrote in his Enaid. But what was the scope? Why? Well, with Enaid, you have to think of it. Romans were shepherds. They, were kind of, they, they really had this sense of inferiority towards the Greeks. So what is the scope of Verger's Enaid? Well, that ultimately Aeneas, a Greek, will be the founder of Rome. And for the law of transit, the of, of transit, of plan, eh, per la legge, I was about to say it in Italian. No, because he was Greek and the Greeks were great, by being the founder of Rome, Rome also became great. This is the function of the myth in these cases. But we have hundreds of myths that are really accompany, accompany us every day. Robin Hood, because we have national myths, but we also have these superheroes who, at the end, identify with a nation. He was a mythic hero who stole from the rich to give, give to the poor. Again, this would be an English myth. William Tell, David Crockett. But even think of the Westerns and the myth of the frontier. One of the most horrible things is the conquest of the frontier. Genocide, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of indigenous people killed. 
we're talking a little bit about now. But for years, they created this myth of the cowboy who goes and does all these things. And people believe these things. In the same way, organized crime groups create myths. One of the most, <coughs> how can I put this? Fantastical is the one of the three brothers, Osso, Mastrosso, and Carcagnoso. The myth wants that these three brothers, who were Spanish, by the way, so even here, the origin of mafia is not Italian, but Spanish. What happens is that their sister is raped by a prince. Now, technically, in the Middle Ages, there was really nothing you could do, right? They instead decide to kill the prince, and they have to flee. But killing the prince is a noble act. They flee, and one stops, and they have to separate. One stops in Sicily, and he founds the Mafia. One stops in Calabria, and he founds the Ndrangata. And the other one stops in Campania, in Naples, and he founds La, Gam La Camorra. These things are at the basis of how these groups are perceived. Now, what is fascinating is that very often, the members of the various groups believe these things themselves. I'm going to show you something with, from a trial with Toto Riina, the boss of bosses, who, by the way, died yesterday. Um, the boss of bosses, who is being ac accused by a turncoat. But let's listen to what the turncoat says. He speaks of the Beati Pauli, the Blessed Paulus. And it's interesting because I, we, with David and my companion, we were in Sicily, and there we, I showed him a restaurant that was called Il Covo dei Beati Paoli. It still exists today. This idea of these, these monks who stole from the rich to give the poor, who made things right for all the injustices that were uh, performed against the people, this idea, and we don't even know if they really existed, the historians are not really sure they did exist, but the members of the Mafia are convinced not only that they did exist, but that they themselves are the hires of this, organi of this benevolent organization. Noi parliamo quando ancora insomma chi chiamò Stibbiate Paole aveva un, un codice d'onore, avevano ripeto una moralità, una dignità personale, almeno le donne non si ammazzavano, i piccini non si ammazzavano, questo con l'entrata vostra dei Corleonesi e Badalamento lo diceva, va bene, e Badalamento diceva chi si sono consumate e vanno consumate a tutti, e, e non si sbagliava, Modolo. e non si sbagliava. Sono presente... Again, absolutely not true. We know, if you look at documents, already at the beginning in the 1880s, there was a, you know, killings of children and of women. We know even today that they continuously kill women and children. Just a few years ago, a turncoat's uh, daughter was kidnapped and put in acid. So these are all things that are in their heads. But what is fascinating is that the person accusing Totorina, the turncoat, says, I'm accusing him because he is not a real mafioso. He has strayed from the values of the Beati Paoli because he kills kids and he kills women. So as you see, it is really also part of their culture. But if you speak to the people, they believe these things. And I find it extremely interesting that uh, in a trial, huh, one is accused of straying, as I said, away from this ideal purpose that the organized crimes groups, that the organized crime group has. That said, as I said, we find them all over, also in the triads. The triads are the organized crime group, the most important organized crime group of China. And they're transnational because like Mafia, Ndrangheta, 
and camorra, they can be found all over the world. And they have flourishing branches right now on every continent. And they control the activity above all in the Chinese communities across the globe. Now, as I said at the beginning, Landrangada is considered the biggest and most powerful organized crime group today. However, speaking to several officials, they're not really sure because some of them believe that the triads are actually bigger, but they are unable to track their growth. Whereas with the Indrangata, they have been able to, with the, the triads, they haven't. And just like the Camorra, the Mafia, and the Indrangata, even the triads have a legend. What is their legend? Well, first of all, it's much older. You go back, really, to a thousand years ago. And the legend is that, according to the members of the triad, there were a group of monks who played a very important role in overturning the Mongol occupation of China. So as you see, they're heroes. They're doing this to free the people from an occupation. Now, the legend wants that the emperor sent, the Mongol emperor sent troops to destroy the monks and to burn down the monastery. At first, 18 monks survived, and then only five made it and organized, as I said, to overturn the emperor. These are very, very old representations of the five monks who actually overturned <coughs> the ruling emperor. Their name comes from a triangle, the triads and the three. This is also interesting because three is a magical number throughout the globe. It is something that is used continuously. So the triangle, as you know, it is also used within Catholic symbology. You know, we have the triangle with the eye. The Masons used it. So even the triads have this symbol that, in a, that represents them. And together with the triads, we have myths of other organized crime groups, which I will not now go and talk about. But the United States of America, which I haven't really touched upon, is very unique. Because there are really two moments with organized crime groups, especially the Italian ones. There is the one, the, the first one that is racially charged. It's against Italians, especially Southern Italians. We'll see that Northern Italians are uh, not really touched about the, not by racism in this sense. But then after, the attitude changes drastically. Not only, the cinema is interested in organized crime almost immediately. There is, we're going to be showing, a, I'm going to be showing you the short film made in 1906 on organized crime. They were called the Black Hand. As you can see, they're always portrayed as being Italians. We'll see that wasn't necessarily true. But this again, 1906, the Black Hand. Obviously, immigrants, Italian, wine, dress poorly. You see how they write now. They're going to show, look, full of mistakes, terrible. They're almost illiterate. We are desperate. Huh?
the butcher obviously represents the right kind of immigrant, right? One who has blended into the American values, who, who writes properly, who is dressed in a certain way. Obviously, you get a threat that your daughter is going to be kidnapped and you just let her walk alone on the streets. That's also. All the vices, you know, Italians have these vices. So it's also a way of racially determining the Italians. And we'll see that this will also have a big impact on certain laws that restricted the immigration of Italians and especially Southern Italians to the United States.
hide in the freezer is always a good idea. So I find this to be a very important document because, as I said, this is 1906, so just at the beginning of uh, cinema. And in, for the following, in the next 10 years, from 1906 to 1916, over 10 films will be made on Italian, on Italian organized crime with uh, uh, the Sicilian Mafia, the criminals, the Padrone's Ward, the last of the Mafia, the poor little Peppina, all movies that really connected organized crime, the black hand, that's what it was called at the time, and Italians. But what is fascinating is that all crimes at a certain point were blamed on Italians, no matter what. Charged with sending black hand letter to his landlord, William Stonehouse, not very Italian. Writer of the Black Hand Letters, again, John C. McLeod. And I could go on and on and on. So what happens is that at a certain point, uh, they characterize Italians as being automatically part of organized crime. Stereotypically, then, Italians are blamed for everything. And those examples I gave you were for mostly Italian newspapers, uh, sorry, Canadian newspapers, but very often there were instances, very often there were, in, there were Italians who were sent back home even though they did not commit the crime because it was 
assumed that being an Italian, you belonged to a group, an organized crime group, especially, actually exclusively, if you were from the South. Perhaps the film that really brings this to the top is Little Caesar from 1931. And it brings it to the top because it's sort of the last film in which there seems to be a total condemnation of organized crime groups. And really, it is focused on southern Italians. Things will change shortly after this. Just very quickly, I just want to point out a few things. to you, Rico. The old bean's working all the time. What'll it be, Gents? Spaghetti and coffee for two. All right, sir. Spaghetti and coffee. And the world pays respects to Diamond Pete Montana. Uh, what's that got to do with the price of eggs? Ah, uh, plenty. Diamond Pete Montana. He don't have to waste his time on cheap gas stations. He's somebody. He's in the big town doing things in a big way. Yeah, look at us. Just a couple of nobodies. Nothing. Is that what you want, Rico? A party like that for you? Cesar Enrico Bandello. Honored by his friends. Well, I could do all the things that fella does and more. Only I never got my chance. Now, what's there to be afraid of? And when I get in a tight spot, I shoot my way out of it. Why, sure. Shoot first and argue afterwards. You know, this game ain't for guys that's soft. money in the big town, all right. And the women. Good time, something doing all the time. Exciting things, you know. Gee, the clothes I could wear. And then I'd quit, Rico. I'd go back to dancing like I used to before I met you. I don't know, I ain't made for this sort of thing. Dancing. That's what I want to do. Dancing. Women. Now, where do they get you? I don't want no dancing. I'm figuring on making other people dance. Oh, I ain't forgetting all about the money. Yeah, money's all right, but it ain't everything. Now, be somebody. Look hard at a bunch of guys and know that they'll do anything you tell them. Have your own way or nothing. Be somebody. You'll get there, Rico. Yeah. You'll show them. Joe, this was our last stand on this bird. We're pulling out. Where are we going? East. Where things break big. There's a shift because if 
before prohibition, there was a totally negative attitude, both in the, with the public and the media, with organized crime, with prohibition, a fascination starts. Why? Because organized crime actually was able to give the people what they wanted. The gangsters started giving people alcohol, and thus they were seen almost as heroes. They were filling a void. They were filling a need. So the attitude towards these organized, the members of organized crime groups changed. They started be, to be seen as people who were giving them products they wanted. So in many ways, prohibition was the moment in which organized crime changed face. There are many stories. You probably heard about Joseph Kennedy and his connections to organized crime. That story is not very clear, but I think that the most credible uh, account is that technically, more than being directly linked with organized crime, it would seem that Joseph Kennedy got a, uh, some information about the uh, prohibition that was about to end, and he bought most of the alcohol available, from a Canadian, by the way, a certain gangster called Perry, uh, and thus, as soon as the Prohibition Act ended, he was able to invade northeastern United States with hundreds of thousands of bottles of whiskey before anyone else, and thus that's how he made the money. But again, all these things are fascinating because they changed the way organized crime groups were perceived, and especially the Italian organized crime group. I'm just going to go very quickly now to other issues of the old and new, and we, which we mentioned. And this is another fault I give uh, the representation of organized crime groups, and that they always, always seem that there is a good organized crime, Corleone, and a bad one. That is not the case. And that is presented in many, many films, unfortunately. And I'm just going to be very, very quickly speak about tattoos. Uh, even though it's useless, given that we've just, saw, we've just seen the film Eastern Promises. Tattoos are extremely important in many organized crime groups, especially in the Thieves with a Code, the Vori Gizacone, where, as you see, on their body they tell the story. You basically have two types of tattoos. Those that, actually, those that are allowed, for example, the stars that are put on, the fact that the knees, that they'll never, you know, you know uh, obey officials, etc. But you also have forced tattoos. And if you remember in the film, they ask, do you have any forced tattoos? A forced tattoo is a tattoo that other members have, you, have engraved on you because you did something. Child molesters very often do that. Uh, have, have these uh, tattoos, or if you did something that you weren't supposed to do. Another fascinating aspect is homosexuality. And it's interesting that technically, in the Vori v. Zaccone, in jail, you are allowed to be an active homosexual. So if you're out and you're not in jail, you cannot have any homosexual acts. But if you're in jail, you can be the active participant. Uh, I'm quoting uh, a, uh, an ex-member uh, of uh, the organization that uh, told Antonio, you can be the giver. If you're the giver, you are not seen as not uh, uh, obeying the rules of the organization. If you don't have tattoos, you don't exist. I don't know what happened there, but the la exactly. A life story is told on your body. And very often, they're symbolic in the, in the sense that the steeples of the church doesn't, don't necessarily represent a church. Very often, they will represent a different institution in which the person has been. Or we'll see that in other traditions, for example, in the Yakuza tradition, they're very, very symbolic. So you'll have to know their mythological meaning in order to decipher what is actually being the story that is being told on their bodies.
The most prominent of the thieves' tattoos is the eight-pointed star, as we saw. The same tattoos on the kneecaps means that the wearer takes a position of anarchy against the rest of society. I won't bow to any other power. I cannot be made fall to my knees. We just saw this, so we won't go over with that. Um, and then, as I said, there are very various meanings of the tattoos. These are photographs from uh, people who are part of the organization and who were in jail. Just to give you an idea of the variety of the possibilities of the various uh, tattoos that one has, which can all be read, and their biographies, ultimately. As I said, the, in, for the Yakutsa, the majority of designs in the Yakutsa tutus focus on Japanese mythology and history. Dragons and koi fish often appear in Yakutsa tattoos as symbols of wealth and prosperity. Now, with the Yakutsa, it's interesting. Samurai warriors represent honor and moral code. The Yakutsa's legend is that they are the descendants of the samurai, which is absolutely not true. But again, to justify their existence and, giving, and to give them a sort of aura of greatness. These are some examples of the Yakuza tattoos. And then, initiation. Now, initiation, and I'm going to conclude because it's really getting late. Uh, initiation is fascinating in many ways because it is parallel to ancient rites. Initiation means that you are then going to become part of this society. And you're going to have to renounce to everything you were before the initiation and to your relations. Again, in the film, but we'll see some footage of actual initiations of organized crime groups, you have to renounce to your family. Your new family is going to be the organized crime group. Your father, your mother, your brother are absolutely unimportant. You are now part of that family and only that family. And we have known about this for some time. One of the first to reveal this was a Joe Valaki, who testified now, in even the Even if I talk, I should never talk about this, and I'm doing so. That's my best way to That explain. is the highest oath you took. Right. In other words, that was the most sacred in, in this organization. Right. I want that you. you would never tell this. Right. This here, what I'm telling you, what I'm exposing to you and the press and everybody, this is my doom. And he, he, he picks your finger. Ooh, ooh. The Godfather he makes a little blood come out. In other words, that's the express, the blood relation. He had the knife and the gun on the table. I repeated some words he told me, but I only could explain what he meant. I could repeat the words, but they were in Sicilian. You repeated, but you didn't understand what they meant. Right. He went on to explain that you lived by the gun and by the knife, and you died by the gun and by the knife. Let's demonstrate just what you did. In other ways, now this piece of paper. This what? piece of paper is burning. This paper is burning. You light it. Yeah. And then uh, in your hand, you say, well, again, they give you words in Italian, but I know what it meant. In other words, while you were repeating yeah. the words, you were burning this, the paper. Right. This is the way I burn if I expose this organization. Everybody gets up and shake hands. They say a few more words together, which I can't recall. They also said in Sicilian. But did you know what they meant? Well, uh, I, I, actually, I never asked what it meant, but it meant like a, a sort of in the style of an organization or, you know, in that style, but I never, you don't bother. I didn't bother. I never did bother. You never did what? I never bothered to find out what it meant, but yeah. I have an idea what it well, meant. Well, you had an idea. What was your idea? All tied up. All, we're all tied up. We're all together. together. All together. We're all together. Who was the boss of the family that you belong to in Casa Nostra? Vito Genovese.
Cristo hay es Santa Sierra, mi Santista. Y hasta el punto que esta Santa Sierra, que el silencio de la noche es otro lado, 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 per la nome di Ribaldi e Mazzini e Marmara, per la parola di uomo di umiltà, forma la Santa Società. Lei ti ha perso un miracolo. The only thing that he doesn't say in his testimony is that the piece of paper is usually has an image of a saint that is being burnt. He doesn't say that, he probably forgot. It's always a saint. Don't forget the Beati Paoli. There's always a connection with the church because of symbolism, because of, of, of needing to be part of the whole tradition. Because organized crime groups are always conservative. Nostalgia is at the basis of their existence also. Just like La Cavaliere Rusticana is nostalgic, organized crime groups want to go back. Family, all these things become important because they, in a certain sense, give people those certainties which have been lost. Many believe that we will, know, we will not be able to defeat organized crime. The big problems today is that really they are being copying in a certain way capitalistic means of going forward. In the sense that uh, if you think of how they are doing things, it is unstoppable. I'll give you an example. Toronto right now, it's a wonderful city, or Quebec, a wonderful province in Canada, both Quebec and Toronto are really, have been invaded by organized crime groups and a portion of their economy is based on organized crime. But it is really difficult to solve. Listen to what happens. I, it is, they try to make it difficult to launder money, but I made, let's say, $50 billion selling cocaine. I can't do anything because if I come to Portugal or if I go to Italy or Spain with this money, they're going to say, oh, where does this money come from? So what's happening is that they're investing it or they're putting it in banks in other countries. So they shell, I'm just going to say a fictitious bank or else I'll be, I'll be sued. But let's say the bank of, to, let's say the bank of Donato Santeramo, Canada. So, the Bank of Donato Santerum of Canada has a branch in an island and branches in Canada. So, I go to the branch in an island on the Pacific and I deposit $50 billion in the Donato Santerum Bank of Canada in an island in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific. Then I go to Toronto to the Bank of Donato Santerum in Canada and say, can I have a loan? Oh, for loans, there are no checks. They don't, they don't go and see where they, they, there's no interest. So I say, I need a loan. I need a loan of $30 million. Oh, but you have $50 million in my other bank. Here you go. Clean money. I build an apartment building with 50, 60, 100 apartments. I'm a politician, I know that this is happening. But if they're building 300 apartment buildings in Toronto and I shut down all this, that will mean 300,000 people will be without a job. What do we do? What do we do? The economy, in Quebec it was different. In Quebec, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking of Canada, but believe me, it is the same basically in most countries in the world. In Quebec, on the other hand, they actually already knew who was going to get the contract to do government work. So there were five families, okay, and the five families would say one, two, three, four, five, and they would not bid against each other. So they would decide, to make this bridge, we need a billion dollars. So we need plus 5% to corrupt, plus 8% to give to the other four families that were not getting the job. 
That's how it was, and it, they just had now a, an inquiry about that. The big issue with all this is that although it's part of our family, it, it becomes very often banal. And, and this is happening especially in TV commercials. There are two commercials that really, this idea of using organized crime and the mob in a funny way is really detrimental because it really undermines the gravity of the situation. And I chose two old, two old uh, commercials, but that I believe are very significant. You still have them today, but these are old ones that... Large pepperoni pizza. A Pepsi, please. A Pepsi. Sure thing, Curly. Pepsi. Here you go, Cupcake. Thank you. I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm going to tell you. We both know I ordered a Pepsi Cola. And now you've insulted me and my entire family by offering me this. this whatever it is. But being a civilized person, I'd like to give you a chance to make amends. Capisce? Yeah. car for the whole family. We forget that our economic system has been based on the same principles that organized crime groups have been using. Think of the multinationals, which are really responsible for the deaths of hundreds of people. The multinationals, which have ruined countries, which have provoked wars, which have really contributed to the downfall of many countries. And if, on the one hand, I have many doubts and I'm very disturbed by some of the things that are present in Francis Ford Coppola's trilogy, there, are some, there is one or two things that I find quite telling. But perhaps the one that I find the most interesting is when Michael is speaking to his wife about his business and they're talking about his father and Michael says my father is no different than any other powerful man like a, sen like a senator or a president and his wife <laughs> laughing <laughs> you know how naive you sound and Michael says why and his wife, Kay, goes, Senator and President, don't have men killed. Okay, who is being naive now, Kay? Thank you. I am ready to address any questions you may have. <laughs> yes? What do you think about the new uh, series that the Little Leonardo Trailers? Uh, Netflix is producing a lot of series about mafia. Yes. You know, the big, the, the idea is that I, I have a problem because very often there's a glamorization of the, of, of the mafia and it is very, very dangerous because it, it really undermines the work of showing what mafia really is. And the glamorization is detrimental also to creating and destroying those myths and those symbols and those rituals because, you know, you can just kill so many people. It's when the symbols, the myths, and, and the, 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 the 
gallantry of these organizations is put forward that really helps them survive. So if the, if the, the series, the film, is factual in many ways and does not give a good or a bad mafia and, is very, and it doesn't glamorize organized crime, I could see it working. In Italy, you know, there's Saviano, you know? And yes, I do think he's a little bit overexposed lately because he's always everywhere and, 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 and talking about things. And although I really enjoyed his, the film that was based on his book, uh, I find the series to be a bit too glamorizing in many ways. Yes, the movie, the movie I, really, I, I really enjoyed, and I think many enjoyed the movie for that reason. But the, 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 the series I find really are detrimental to understanding organized crime. They're criminals, they're terrible, they're people that are not nice, they're not. They're, 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 there's, there's no such thing as a good mafioso or a good person who belongs to the Yakuza or a good person who, no, it just, it's a contradiction, they can't. That's, they kill people. They, our lives, unfortunately, are impartially controlled by what they do. What we pay for things, um, you know, the moment in which they want a percentage on when they have a contract from a government means they're taking your tax dollars because it's costing 10% more. Where's that money gonna come? It comes from us. So, you know, and this is, you know, this is the, the lighter part. They kill people, the moment in which we buy something. So all these things, we have to always keep this in mind. Yes? <laughs> when they kill each other, well, when they kill each other, it's not good because technically what's happening, it's really just for control over territory. And what happens is that it, again, affects everyone's lives, but then there's a, a new order that is established, and usually the new order will then just continue doing what the other order does. Now, the idea is they try not to kill anymore. The whole, because if they start killing, the the last resort is to kill someone. You know, when they killed Borsellino in Italy, when they killed Falcone or the Generale della Chiesa, they, that means that they were really on the edge of being put, to jail, put in jail by the hundreds. Because the moment in which you kill someone, that means police presence, more controls, everything. And in Italy, it was very, very particular because we mustn't forget uh, that Italian politicians for many years collaborated with the Mafia. Now, <coughs> I'm not saying that necessarily they were all corrupt, but there was this sort of, you don't bother us, we won't bother you. It was a, a sort of a compromise. So much that when, when the policies finished, if you remember, for a couple of years, the Mafiosi in Italy became terrorists. They started putting bombs to terrorize people. And it wasn't the Red Brigades, it wasn't ISIS, it was actually the Mafia that was putting a bomb at San Giovanni in a church, in front of a church to kill people. So, as I said, you know, a st state can live without corruption. Corruption cannot exist without a government. It just can't, you have to have someone to corrupt. And this is why we have to always keep in mind and be alert on who is governing us. But as I said, it's not easy because sometimes the decisions are, especially today, where it is white collar mafia. Usually now you have mafia, Cosa Nostra, they're white collar. You know, just like in The Godfather 3, that is quite accurate. They're really not involved in the nitty gritty. They don't kill people, they take the money from South America, they invest it, they clean it, they make sure that, so they don't want people to be killed. They don't want things to happen because that way they can really manage the fortunes better. And you know, they're very generous with their money. They build schools now. You know, think in South America, <coughs> why are they so popular? Well, because they take over from what the state should do sometimes. So they build a school, they give money to the poor, etc. But it has a price, and the price is that you are then obliged to do what they tell you to do. There's no going back.
Uh, hi. Um, well, first of all, I really, um, I really enjoyed this presentation. Uh, I'm Italian as well. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question about Gomorrah, the series, since you, you were mentioning it before. Um, I, I really enjoyed the first uh, series of Gomorrah, the second less, but the first I really enjoyed it. And um, I don't know, I had the feeling that uh, there wasn't much uh, glamorize, glamorization of the Mafia, because actually the protagonist, Ciro Di Marzio, he kills uh, a 16, brutally kills a 16-year-old girl with his, with his own hands. Then he kills his wife. I mean, he's a person that, uh, at the beginning, he seems charming, but then it's really difficult to identify with him because he does things that are totally like brutal. I agree yeah. with you, but yeah. as you said, if you look at the second series, for example, that brutality yeah. seems to go. Yeah, I to, don't like. To, yeah, I don't right, like that disappear. very much. So, yeah. the, the the problem is that. He's really charming at the beginning, and he commits brutal acts. But I was really referring to the second series, what I found quite weak. So the start okay. was, I mm, think, yeah. valid, yeah. and then it sort of lost its. They lost their way in many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah I, I agree, I agree yeah. with you 100. percent Yeah, um, I don't know if I have time for another small question uh, about the God, the Godfather, the scene that uh, that you showed, the very first scene of the Godfather when he when he offers help for Vendetta to. Uh, the guy comes uh, uh, seeking help for the uh, for the girl for the daughter that was raped, uh, and uh, you were saying that this does doesn't correspond to what uh, the mafia boss mafia bosses really are, and uh, I um, I totally agree with that. I think mafia bosses today are like totally different. They are not this romanticized. <laughs> uh, they they're not uh, um, these romanticized uh, figures. Uh, but at the same time, I thought that this was referring more to the uomo d'onore, like the ancient um, Sicilian uomo d'onore that uh, actually tried to help people also in uh, ways like that. Uh, don't you think that Coppola was making a reference to like the old style, like before the mafia started? Mafia for, well, the mafia, the modern, uh, in the modern sense of the word. Right. So, and I agree with you, but that sense of honor Yes. Yeah. However, delinquent. Yeah, of course. Of course. Of course. Right? Of course. The, the the issue I have with it is that if you're going to show it, at least show something else, because technically, there are two scenes: this one here and the one where the producer finds his horse's head in his bed. Yeah. Now yeah. the producer is doing his job, but if you look at how he's portrayed, most people are happy that they kill that that his horse's head is chopped off and put in his bed because mm -hmm. he's portrayed as an ass. Right, mm -hmm. and yeah. even here. So we only have this scene, and it's true. It's about honor, but don't forget the 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 girl is not raped because he says oh, yeah, they're, yeah, they're that's not right. able that's right. to. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. but what what is happening is that he creates in in this scene some sympathies. Oh, I understand that father. Father, after what they did, they went free. Okay, but there's not another example in which, more realistically, right? They you know, a, 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 a godfather says, oh, he called your name? I'm going to rip his tongue out. That and happens put... in Godfather number three. Sorry? That happens in the third one. It happens later on. Yeah. But in this first one, it is quite disturbing. Yeah. With the cat, I just found it almost. And, you know, then you have, always in Coppola's movies, very often, you have Il Mafioso con la Coppola, <laughs> which is the good mafioso. <laughs> and the more sophisticated one, the one who wants to take over. Also, you know, oh, we don't do drugs, please. That never existed, that they were always in yeah. drugs. They didn't care about the neighborhood. They're really about the money, right? Because money yeah. and power is what they do. End yeah. of story. And of they course. kill people. They kill women. They kill children. They kill innocent people. They really don't care. The mm -hmm. idea is that they need to maintain power. My point is that together with the police investigating them and making mm -hmm. and, 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 pro, uh, and prosecuting them, we have to understand the role that rituals have, the role mm -hmm. that symbols have. Yeah. Because very often the recruitment is made thanks to these things, thanks to this mystical atmosphere that they create. And it's, in, in the United States of America, sometimes it's terrible. You have these Italo-Americans that pretend they're mobsters. They don't even know what it means, right? And they all speak, mm -hmm. hey, hello, hey, so how's it going? Huh? You doing okay? What is, you know, it's a, because they have this myth of organized mm -hmm. crime, which is 
really, really detrimental yeah. in many ways. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, what's the relationship between the different mafia organizations across the world? Do they collaborate or they are in conflict of interest? Okay, they collaborate very much. Uh, they usually have different roles. For example, one organized crime group, which I haven't spoken about, are the Hells Angels, for example. And it's interesting because they're being Anglo and white. We don't really talk about them very much. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, they collaborate and they usually when they do collaborate, they have different roles. So I do this, you do that, you do that. They also sometimes decide to, to, um, to um, be possessive of certain areas. But you have, whereas before you had a cupola that was within the organized crime group, now at times you have a cupola that is made of various organizations, but right now at the top is Landrangata, which is really, and you know, it's Landrangata, Calabria. You know where the center of the world for Landrangata is? Reggio Emilia, <laughs> believe it or not, in northern Italy. That's where their headquarters is. Small city. It's a small city, they have control, yeah. but this is, you know, and, and just to see how it really makes, you know, it's how the world has changed. And Landrangata, which most of you had never heard of, is the most powerful organized, organized crime group in the world today. It brings in like a million dollars every five minutes or something. I've read some, some ridiculous amount of money. You know, they have all the, but obviously, because they, they, they about collaboration, they control all the cocaine that comes out of South America. That's why, for example, you probably know Nicola Grattieri, no? He goes to Colombia with Antonio because that's what's happening. You have, it's a chain. You have the producer, the distributor, and the investor. The Italians are now mostly here. With the, you know, so, and again, Coppola, if you remember in the Godfather Three, donation to the churches, I want to be clean, I'm a businessman, all these things, because that's the image they want to have. But the other groups are doing the quote-unquote dirty work, but ultimately they're just as responsible, don't get me wrong. And if there is a clash, think of what happened in Germany where they killed six, <coughs> excuse me, six people. So if it's nece absolutely necessary, they kill, but it has to be absolutely necessary amongst themselves above all but which is, is less detrimental to their business. Oh, by the way, you know, in the Coppola's films, they hardly, they hardly ever use the word capitalism, but they use business, at least I would say between 40 and 50 times. It's a business, it's a business, it's a business. Well, it is a business in many ways. But and it, in American movies. Sorry? Never in the American movies they say this is the capitalism. They say this is the business. This man. is the business. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> in my next conference next year, we'll talk about how Francis Ford Coppola production and organized crime actually made an agreement, or else the film would not have been made. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>